Please welcome to the stage Friends of the Children, Executive Director Terry Sorensen, Thrive CEO Omalara Fatirigan, and United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey President, CEO Bill Golderer. Every time a child or an adult finds themselves impoverished, uh, the constraints on the future are very real. And uh, so I'm going to engage in a discussion uh, with two folks who um, are not from the same geography, are not attacking this problem necessarily from exactly the same vantage point, and yet there's a lot in common that we're going to explore together. And so the three areas that I, I shared uh, with both Terry and Omalara are the following. Um, we're going to engage first in the imperative. There's a moral imperative as, that underscores their work. And I think one of the things that Brett, who I'm so grateful for, for saying when we're talking about this issue, we're talking about humanity. Uh, some of you may know I have a Sunday job, and everybody is created in the image of the divine. And the idea that we would decide to foreclose upon someone's future by the decisions we're making today seems impossible to me. And these are two folks who share that there is a moral urgency to this issue that is confronting us. And so I'm grateful that they're not happy with the America we're living in and that they're willing to extend themselves in a sacrificial way to confront this moral imperative. The second comes from um, Charlie Parker, uh, which is about finance. Uh, Charlie Parker says, uh, romance without finance is a, nu is a nuisance. Um, so, you know, Ideas that we should steal, they're all great unless there's capital behind them. So let's talk about what capital needs to be invested over what period of time and, to what, and what can we expect as a return on our future. And third is about them personally. I don't know about you, but this pandemic has taken a lot out of me personally. Can I get vulnerable with you guys for a minute? I'm tired a little bit but I'm energized by this room and I wanna know from them, how do they sustain themselves in the work? Because when you say, I wanna work on meaningful reduction of poverty in Philadelphia, you either get an amen or an eye roll. And we need a lot more amens and a fewer eye rolls. And I wanna unlock their secrets to how they sustain their energy and commitment to this very difficult work. I know nobody's ever said no to you, Omalara, but if they did, you know, call me up and we'll talk about it. Um, so very quickly, if it's all right, I'm going to, um, Terry, start with you, which has to do with this idea of the moral imperative. And your approach, with the, and you both have a two-gen approach, I really appreciate the urgency, but the holistic nature of, with which you attack this problem. So before I turn it to Omalara, can you talk about, when I say the moral imperative for your work, what is underneath your model and how you approach it? Sure, well first, I'd like to just share, our model is selecting children age four to six who are facing systemic barriers like incarcerated parents, homelessness, foster care, providing them with a paid professional mentor for their whole childhood, 12 plus years no matter what, and coming alongside, as Bill said, in a two-gen approach. So not just supporting the child, but the caregiver, and it has a ripple effect on the whole family. I think when I think about the moral imperative there are over 20,000 children across the country who are facing the most serious systemic barriers. Um, we take the highest of the highest risk in terms of what they're facing, the barriers they're facing, and invest in them for their whole childhood. And that's really what we've seen it takes to overcome those obstacles and break generational cycles of poverty. We've been doing it for 30 years, and it's about the power of relationship but it's, it's also about the evidence that we have that shows that the model works. And so we have this model and we know that it works. And so I, I feel like it's imperative that we scale it to other communities, but only if they want us. So Omalara, let's, um, I mean, you've, uh, you speak uh, the language of social change I'm most familiar with, which is like dollars and cents, but I know there's probably some, share a little bit about Thrive. What do we need to know about it? But tell me, if you don't mind, like what's underneath like that for you? How did you come 
to embrace this as the avenue for social change and what's, what's the moral imperative behind Thrive? You know, first of all, thank you for having me. This is my first real in-person event. And so um, I'm just excited to be out of the house and <laughs> clothed from the waist up. <laughs> and I could find stuff that fit a little bit. Um, but, you know, Thrive is about moving money and power to break cycles of poverty. And we do that by supporting government officials to budget for equity, right? root out systemic racism. And so the moral imperative that really drove me, like a lot of us after the killing of George Floyd, um, I wanted to do something. I should probably seek Bill's counsel because I was just really frustrated, right? I was really angry. You know, we're talking about racism and we're not talking about economic justice, right? Cycles of poverty are the legacy of racism in this country. The two go hand in hand. And so if we're not talking about you know, economic justice, if we're not talking about breaking the chains of poverty, then we're not talking about equity. And that's really at the core of the Thrive model. So we're gonna shift a little bit and I'm gonna try and create some room for you all to engage with these folks. Um, that's my promise. Uh, to you. So one of the things we're going to shift to is about when we talk about financial modeling and, and really evidence yeah. uh, of, of impact or, or the why, there's the moral imperative, but then there's this idea that the, the, the next bar to clear, not just are you convicted that we need a different world, but is what you are describing worth doing and can you share with me what the return for, for humanity would be, for budgets, what, why are we doing this versus something else? But let me just talk about evidence for a minute. Um, as I told you, I had a Sunday job, but I also have a lifetime job, which is as a husband. And I, uh, sometimes I was talking to Corey, I can be late, I'm working on this. And after being late for the maybe 20th time, I said to my partner, Julie, I'm really sorry. And she said, you know what? I don't wanna hear that anymore. I want you to show me you're sorry. Demonstrate that you're sorry by not doing that anymore. So instead of describing impact, there's an evidence layer when we're talking about folks that we're trying to be of service to. So can I start with you really quickly about something that really struck me, which is when you talk about a city budget, it's a moral document. Yeah. And, uh, your approach to centering an engagement with a budget, a municipality budget, really struck me. Quick commercial before I get into this. When we were engaging with a meaningful approach to set our sights really high on creating the conditions for our neighbors to achieve their corner of the American dream, what could we do with an available, allocable dollar? What are we currently doing that we need to do more of? What are we not doing that we say in the South we might could? Yeah. And what do we need to stop doing that has no evidence that's helping? And any meaningful engagement with that in means an engagement with the city of Philadelphia, a $5.26 billion engine that is supposed to be creating the conditions for well-being. When I said that to some philanthropy about a, a $20 million initiative over, each year over five, to do something real, some philanthropy and social change folks leaned out of that and said, I don't wanna be engaged with the city because I don't wanna be engaged with it, it's too messy. There's one corporate citizen that raised their hand first and said, put us down to be the first in this pie and that's Comcast. I just want you all to know, the first people to raise their hand was Comcast to say we have to get engaged. And the word I got was, we can't, we don't ask us to be a savior, but you can ask us to be a leader. So let me ask you, with that posture, I think that where we talk about budgeting, if you asked anybody who's in, involved in the city budgeting process, they would say, we're doing a great job. And you are, what I saw you doing, or your approach is saying, budgets could be better done if they were not presented, but they were co-created yeah. and there was a power shift. 
Can you talk about this methodology of co-creation yeah. of budgeting? Because it's really stand out. Yeah. So don't give up on cities. In 163 cities and counties across this country, racism has now been declared a public health crisis. And they are hiring chief equity officers, chief innovation officers, chief resilience officers. And I talk to them all the time. I've talked to 30 in 15 states. And they all tell me that they need tools to do their work. And so the tool that we have created is you know, we've got public schools spending more on school police officers than school social workers. We have foster care systems spending more on congregate care than on prevention programs like Terry's that would keep kids out of the system in the first place. So let's take a step back. What we've done is we've compiled everything we know from the impact evaluation literature on what actually works in breaking cycles of poverty. We roll all of that into an index, and then we compare the index to what the government is actually spending money on. And they get a super simple score, red light, yellow light, green light, right? We all learned that long, long ago. But we're more than just you know, a software company spitting out report cards. We use our data to facilitate a process where government officials come together with BIPOC community leadership to look at the data, look at the results, look at the recommendations, and then now let's co-create what we're going to invest in. Let's co-create next steps together. And so this is the way to not only move money, but to move power, to lift up the desires of Black, Brown, Indigenous, queer, all kinds of people, and to put them at the decision-making table and to say, this is what our next you know, phase should look like. And so we're really about kind of systems change by empowering historically disenfranchised communities. I'm coming to you in a second. I'm going to take a risk here, though. This is, this is where it's going to go off the rails. Um, so... Uh, the demographics are well known. I see my friend Jennifer Rodriguez, who's doing all this incredible work at the Hispanic Chamber, highest, um, the, the fastest growing population in, in Philadelphia County. And, and we still are a uh, 44% African American uh, by population county. We have well, we have um, very good representation among elected officials. I guess the question is if that's true, why? is it that it's not the default posture to budget in a way that you're describing? Like if, it's, if you are elected to represent the, the well-being of people who got you there, and if you're accountable to people who are on the ground, shoulder to shoulder, doing the work at the Hispanic Chamber where there's systemic divestment, and you know that your charge there is to ensure that there's appropriate investment. Yeah. I'm not saying this isn't the most equitable budget in the city of Philadelphia of anywhere in the country, but I have suspicions that it's not. So the question is where you've been, why is it often that there is not this level of knowledge about why the budgets don't reflect the priorities that you have uncovered as actually equitable? It's because everyday people aren't in the room. And it's easy to ignore someone that you cannot see, cannot hear, and do not know. Um, I, I actually worked in DC's Juvenile Justice Agency. I was deputy director. And you know we had teams of social workers who wanted to do the right thing, right? They wanted to refer kids to programs that would work. Um, and they would come to me because I was there and I would share with them interventions or mentoring programs or, or the like. But what Thrive endeavors to do is to open up the door and bring the community in. And when people are actually visible, right, actually audible, you can hear them, you can see them, you can feel them. I think that emotional connection is what will make things nudge the needle just a little bit. I mean, we've all felt what isolation has done in the pandemic. And so kind of bringing community and government officials together 
town hall meetings, facilitating conversations, looking at data together, rolling up our sleeves together. Um, you know, maybe it sounds Pollyanna, but um, I have hope. And I, I don't want to talk too much, but um, I have hope because I know this works, right? I have my, I, I was raised in Southwest Philly. I learned how to ride my bike in Clark Park by a single low income immigrant woman. And she sent both my brother and me to Harvard. Um, and it was a budget decision. At the time, Thomas Jefferson University made the decision to offer free college to their employees. She went to school at night, she became a pharmacist, and she transitioned us out of poverty. So now if this one private institution and my mom, <laughs> if that's what they can do, what would happen if we unlocked the $3.2 trillion that state and local governments spend every year? I have hope. Good. It's a reason not to leave it alone, um, for sure. So Terry, um, turning to you, your, um, your impact model and the emphasis on independent evaluation, um, which I really value, it's evident the impact that you're having on the lives of families. But one of the things that caught me a little off guard, and I was like, oh, this is interesting, which is you're not shy about talking about societal impacts of your program, meaning when a child, uh, when someone uh, moves through Friends of the Children successfully, there are impacts on our society, our system, criminal justice, educational attainment, other metrics. Can you talk a little bit about how that became part of your story, why that matters, and maybe a word about the long view? Because I loved your model doesn't say, this is overnight, because that's what I, I think is really powerful, sustained investment. Sure, so you know, we were founded by a man named Duncan Campbell who was an entrepreneur, and he himself would have been in the program. And when he sold his company and had resources for the first time, he hired a researcher to travel the country and say what program would help break the cycle of poverty, and that you know, what program would help no child had the childhood he had. Alcoholic parents, in and out of prison, and often left alone. This researcher spent two years traveling the country, and while he didn't find that program, he came back with the core principles, which was start early, stay for the long term, and actually pay people to do this work with the most uh, challenge. And as a result, from the very beginning, we have been evidence-based and data-informed. Um, we started with a third-party evaluation 30 years ago, year after year. That turned into a National Institute of Health randomized control trial. 14 years, it studied uh, our chapters in Boston, Seattle, Portland, and New York City. And now we're really excited. Uh, the Conrad and Hilton Foundation just invested in a randomized control trial of our two-gen portion of our model that'll occur at five sites across the country. And really, um, you know, it's that evidence, and we had the Harvard Business School Association of Oregon do a return on investment study, showed for every $1 invested, the return was over $7. And that's important because, as you said, we know our work's impactful. We see the impact every day in our children and our families, but we actually have the data and evidence to back it up, which has led to more investment and more scaling across the country. But in the end, my favorite is I had a researcher from the University of Chicago, Chapin Hall, Child Welfare, and she studied our model, and then she said, I really think the secret sauce is love. <laughs> So let me ask you a question as a nonprofit practitioner. Um, someone asked me when you're coming to United Way, like, what's the job? Um, and there's several jobs, but one of the jobs is there has been a way of engaging with folks who are on the ground doing the work, who know the most, who are most proximate to the struggle. The way we value that work in philanthropy is by pitting them together, pitting them against each other in a sick and twisted Hunger Games scenario. Can I get an amen? 
disrupting the cycle of everyone has a model that they believe in or they wouldn't show up to do it. And yet, how do we create the conditions of, I think we've, we have minted in Philadelphia people who have gotten very sophisticated at saying they're collaborative when in practice they show up like it, with like ultimate fighting champions and they're gonna fight over a dollar. So the question is, how do you incentivize collaboration? Because collaboration is expensive. Anywhere else, if you're trying to invest in collaboration, we invest in it, we pay for it. But in nonprofits, it's because you're a good person, we're supposed to just take your valuable time and say, please collaborate. I don't believe in that. But I think that you might have some insight about how, because you've talked about the importance of collaboration in your work and learning, can you talk about something we might be able to learn in Philadelphia about that? Because I'm passionate about not treating practitioners in that way. Yeah, well, it reminds me of when we um, went to Chicago and we were hearing from the community that you need to be in the west side of Chicago, the Austin neighborhood, where the gang violence is the highest of anywhere in Chicago. And we sat down with a group of community organizations and we gave our pitch and our presentation, and they said, wow, that sounds like a really great program. But the question is, do we want you? And, you know, ultimately they decided they did. Um, but I really, you know, Friends of the Children is not going to solve generational poverty for the entirety of Philadelphia. It's a partnership. We are a piece that, you know, can fill a need. And in every community we've gone to so far, we hear, you know, yes, this is needed. Please come. And we hear that from other nonprofit leaders as well as funders. So while in the beginning there can maybe uh, from one or two organizations a little feeling of, hey, don't, don't steal our piece of the pie of philanthropy, um, most really say, I mean, we partner with Big Brothers Big Sisters, with others that say, you know, this piece, we're having a hard time serving these children and families, and we'd love for you to be a part of this community. So, Omalar, I'm going to invite you next, and I'm going to try and, I think we're okay on time, we're going to create some time for conversation. Um, we still have um, a lot of headwinds in our communities for your own work. Um, I know how energizing it is to be in this room with everybody, but I still think you know, like if you scratch just a little below the surface, um, there's, there's more than a modicum of, of discouragement, right? And in my Sunday job, there's this idea of a benediction, a good word. Um, what, what is it that you've turned to to sustain yourself in belief? Because you're up against headwinds. If you want to, if you want to talk about the the vanguard of changing the status quo, the first thing I think of is city government. I mean, if you have a sense of urgency for change, go to city hall. That's a joke. Um, but you drive your life into the headwinds of these entities because you believe that something different and better can come from it. How do you sustain yourself when there's a lot of social change folks here? No one is happy with the status quo. How do you sustain yourself? I call my mom. <laughs> um, What's your mom's number? Put that up on <laughs> the screen. Oh my gosh, my mom would talk to everyone in this room. <laughs> She's uh, a true extrovert. Um, my mother is my source of inspiration, right? Um, how did she, how did this woman defy all of the odds? Um, my mom is my rock. My mom reminds me to pray when I don't want to pray anymore, right? And so, um, you know, having this woman still in my life, I hope she lives a thousand more years, um, has really scaffolded me and, has really just taught me that change is possible. There are no chains that can't be broken, right? Um, that stubbornness and tenacity, when I, when I need it, I call her. And I kiss my dog, right? I, 
<laughs> I take my dog for a run. Um, I, I try to find joy in my life um, in whatever way I can find it to, to sustain me. But without my mother, um, there would literally be no Thrive. Go mom. Um, one more question. For folks that you are willing to join forces with, allies, co-conspirators, people who you feel like you can hitch your wagon to and, and dig in with, what are, what are two, one or two attributes that you look for? I mean, you're new and you're new, you know, you're hanging out. I can give you a read on a lot of the people in this room later. Um, but just tell me about the attributes of, that you're looking for when you're saying, this is an investable person that I want to dig in with. So I tell them what I'm about to tell you, and then I read their body language. And what I tell them is, um, are you ready to share power? And before you answer that question, because everybody knows the answer, you're supposed to say yes. Sharing power means... Whatever it is that you want to do, exactly how you want to do it, that's not gonna happen, right? I've got this great software and I spit out these programs and I love what I've, no community is gonna take 100% of what I give them. And so when I, when I talk to folks that are interested in Thrive, when I talk to city government people, are you ready to um, add pages to your playbook? And if their body language says, huh, yeah, maybe, maybe, right? If, if, if they've taken it in and really understood that what exactly they've done for 15 years on the job is just not going to work, um, and if they're ready to take that step, cautiously, I'll take that, but pensively, thoughtfully, let's go. Wow, Terry, oh no, Terry gets to answer. Go, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go and find a question from the audience while you- Could somebody else do it? <laughs> I'm kidding. Terry, same question to you. A, a good word for those who are in it, how do you sustain yourself, and what do you look for in a co-conspirator? Well, I'm a recovered CPA, so don't hold that against me. But I do find my financial background helps me in running a national nonprofit every day. And I guess, you know, I love my job. Every day I get up and I'm working with communities around the country, folks who want to improve their communities, who want to come alongside children and families and help them change their own narrative and their own stories. And so no day is ever the same. And I think you would have thought this pandemic um, maybe would have shut it all down, but we figured out how to serve children and families virtually, and now we're back in person everywhere. Um, and we figured out, we, we expanded to nine new communities during this pandemic. So every day getting up and while it's tire, tiring, uh, doing Zoom call after Zoom call, um, it did really help lay the foundation so that when we come to a community and we meet people, they're really excited about what we're doing. So, um, and getting to meet great people like yourselves. I mean, all across the country, I'm seeing hope because people do want change and they do want to invest, especially in their children and families. Let's hear from you. Hey, we got, we got a question over here. Comments, uh, questions. We're, we're going to have time for just, just one question. And also I want to... Um, uh, Two, two observations. Reverend Golderer mentioned his wife, Julie. I know Julie. He may be a reverend, but she's a saint. Uh, imagine living with that. Uh, quick, quick question here. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Terrell, uh, but some people in Philadelphia know me as your fave trash man. <laughs> um, I, I just had a really, I'm sitting here with Julie from Green Philly, and um, <laughs> we, we go to these things a lot when it talks about poverty and government, and we always feel like while there's a huge disinvestment, like the bigger disinvestment is in the environment and the surroundings of those children and trauma. So we were just saying, where do you two feel 
the importance of the environment that these children in trauma are in? And what are some steps or some processes that you guys have come across in the different cities? Because, you know, Philly is not only the dangerous city, it is the dirtiest city in America. So we just wanted to know your thoughts on where do you see or how do you see environment, environmental justice and economic justice, systemic racism, like where do they all marry each other and meet each other at the top? Can I jump in? Yes, please. I am so glad you lifted up environmental justice. Um, so we do a number of equity audits. We do equity audits of parks and recreation. Who gets the new pool? Who gets the new playground set where the kid you know, won't have arthritis in 10 years, right? And so we look at tree canopy by neighborhood. We look at where are the tree planting initiatives? And so we absolutely understand that racism takes many forms. It's in our juvenile you know, justice system. It's in our parks and recreation system. It's in public health. And so absolutely, we look at the green infrastructure, the access to you know, bike paths, the access to trails and other things when we understand that kids have to grow up at, like you said, in communities. And we come in and we hire leaders from the neighborhoods where we are needed most and um, establish a 501c3 in the local community that then has its own board of directors, its own leadership, and the friends who are working with, each of them working with eight children and families. Because we know, you know, from Portland, Oregon, while this is a great idea to steal, Philly really has to own it. And each neighborhood that needs it most is where we would look to be and help with those environmental factors. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna break in a minute, but two things. One is I just want to be clear that my trash talk regarding uh, Bill is Bill is my brother from a Gentile mother. So so uh, uh, th this is a long-standing relationship. Terry, uh, what is your plan for Philadelphia? Are you are are we gonna get uh, uh, friends of the children here? Well, that's up to you. <laughs> No, um, I was so honored to be invited, and I actually brought a whole team of people, the Friends of the Children table over here, and we're here for the next three days, um, really meeting with community members, seeing if, if uh, Philly wants Friends of the Children here. So if you're interested, please talk to me or someone at the table. We also put folders and books out that are free, and would love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you all so much. So just the last word, um, I'm very grateful to all of you for, um, for being here. If you're, so many of you I know, um, some of you I don't. I just, I would say when we talk about the challenges facing Philadelphia, um, oftentimes I feel like folks come away and they say, it's just too big and it's too complicated and I just don't know what to do or where to start. And by your being here and believing that this can be more just, more equitable, more loving, I'm, I'm grateful to see you all. So thanks for, for caring enough to be here.